our Christmas series, Worship Him, The Invitation of Christmas. And today's message is titled, Pour Your Heart Out. We're returning to Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, and also verse 11, which has been uh, the foundation passage for our series. So today's uh, sermon is, Pour Your Heart Out. You know, I read a story recently called The Gold Wrapping Paper, The Gold Wrapping Paper. And it was about a man who worked very hard just to be able to keep food on the table for his family. And this particular year, a few days before Christmas, he was upset with his five-year-old daughter because she used up the family's only roll of gold wrapping paper. You know that kind of uh, foil-type paper that's kind of uh, shimmery? And and to them, it was an expensive roll of toilet paper because, uh, not of toilet paper. (laughs) No, that's COVID. We're going to wrap in toilet paper this year. (laughs) She she used up this expensive uh, roll of gold wrapping paper, and it was the only one they have. And since money was tight, he became even more upset when on Christmas Eve, he saw that she had used all this expensive gold paper to decorate a shoebox under the tree. And and, and then he was also concerned about where she had gotten money to buy whatever it was that was in the shoebox. And so he got very upset and he yelled at his daughter and what have you. And the next morning, the little girl, filled with excitement, brought the gift box to her father and said, here, daddy, this is for you. And the father now regretted how he had been so upset with her the night before. But when he opened up the shoebox, he found it was empty and he got upset all over again. And he said, don't you know, young lady, when you give somebody a present, there's supposed to be something inside the package. And the little girl looked up at him with tears running down her eyes and her face. And she whispered, daddy, it's not empty. I didn't have any money to buy you a gift. But I blew kisses into the box until it was full, and I wrapped it up and gave it to you. Oh, the father was crushed, and he fell on his knees, and he put his arms around this precious little girl, and he begged her to forgive him for his anger, because she had poured her heart out into that box that he thought was empty. You know, it it really is not the wrapping or even the gifts, right? But it's the heart behind the giving that matters. You know, we say something like, it's the thought that counts. But what we mean is it's the heart that went in uh, to the gift. And, and, and we see that also reflected in the first Christmas story. Read with me, if you will, Matthew chapter 2. And we're reading verses 1 and 2 and also verse 11. If you don't have your Bible and you're listening to us by live stream, go and grab it real quick. Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 and 2 and verse 11. The scripture says, Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it arose, and we have come to worship him. Then in verse 11, it says, they entered the house and saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened up their treasure chests and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. You know, as we've been moving through the series, we're looking at different ways of worshiping the Lord as reflected in a variety of postures of our soul outwardly. And we looked previously at raising our hands in thanksgiving and praise to the Lord. We looked last week at worshiping the Lord with our giving, which uh, is, is an important aspect of our worship. But a less obvious means of worship is pouring our heart out to the Lord. You look again at verse 11, the phrase that says, they opened their treasure chest. You know, as I was reading through this passage and reflecting uh, on the scripture in preparation for these messages, and I was praying, um, that phrase, they opened their treasure chest, just seemed to just jump right off the page at me. And that's usually, as you're reading scripture and studying God's word, that's usually when God is trying to say something to you. Have you ever had that happen to you in your own personal time? You're reading and studying God's word, and all of a sudden, something just jumps off the page at you and grabs your attention. And and that's when God is trying to say something to us. And, And so I've learned to stop. And pay attention and say, God, what is it that you are saying? And and two words stood out to me, the words opened and the words and the word treasure. And I was reminded of the words of Jesus from Matthew 6, 21, where he says, for where your treasure is, 
there your heart will be also. And in the preceding verses to that, Jesus cautions against storing up earthly treasures which can be stolen or they can rust, they can decay over time. But rather he encourages us to store up eternal treasures that can never be lost. Amen. And then he challenges us to consider where our treasure is. Are we living for the temporary stuff of this earth or are we living for eternity, where is our treasure? And then he adamantly declares that we cannot live for the earthly and the eternal at the same time. He said, we will either love one and hate the other, but you can't serve God and the material things of this world Amen. at the same time. And he tells us that what we treasure is the clearest indicator of the condition of our heart, the two are directly connected. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And when the wise men found Jesus, they opened their treasures and they gave Jesus costly gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Their actions revealed their heart. In Jesus, they found something much more valuable than the most treasured things of this world because the gifts they offered him were very costly. And they opened their treasures and they laid it before him as an act of worship. In giving their treasure, they were offering him their hearts in worship because where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. They were opening their hearts and pouring it out before Jesus in an act of worship that was so well-pleasing in God's sight that he made sure it was recorded in Scripture for all time to be an example of worship for us. God wants worship that is not just from our minds, but from the depths of our inner being. Ahead, he wants us to pour our hearts out to him in extravagant yes. worship. Pouring our heart out to him is opening ourselves up. Opening ourselves up, making ourselves vulnerable, expressing to him what is in our heart and offering our lives to him. The first thing we do is we pour our heart out in worship. And as I reflected on pouring our heart out, it reminded me of the story of an immoral woman. I'm sure you remember this story. It's in Luke 7, verses 36 through 50. And this immoral woman interrupted a dinner party in the home of a Pharisee. And she broke an alabaster box of expensive perfume. And she poured out her treasure. That was probably the only thing of value she owned. She poured out her treasure, anointing Jesus' feet. And then she washed his feet with her tears, and she wiped them with her hair. Here's another instance of someone who poured out their treasure. They opened it up and poured it out on Jesus. Now, her worship was criticized by the Pharisee in whose home Jesus was being hosted. And, and, and he thought to himself, if Jesus was truly a prophet, he would know what kind of woman this is, and he wouldn't allow her to touch him. You know, that judgmental religious attitude. But Jesus rebuked the Pharisee's thoughts. Jesus knew what he was thinking. The Pharisee didn't even say it. But Jesus rebuked his thoughts, saying, you invited me into your house, but you didn't even greet me with a kiss, which was the customary greeting of that day. You didn't wash my feet or anoint my head with oil, all of which were common courtesies that were extended to any guest that you invited into your home. But Jesus was saying, you showed me no love. You showed me no honor whatsoever. But Jesus commends the woman's worship, saying, she has not ceased to kiss my feet or to wipe, wash my feet with her tears or to wipe them with her hair and to anoint them with her rare treasure. 
And he made sure that her act of worship was recorded in scripture as an example of the kind of worship that pleases him. And it pleases him when we pour out our heart in gratitude for what he has done for us. In the story of this immoral woman, if you look in Luke 7, 47, he says, I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love, but a person who is forgiven little only shows little love. You see, this woman was a sinner in a big way. Some, uh, some suggest she might have been a prostitute, but nonetheless, everybody knew she had a bad reputation. Everybody knew her. Even Jesus knew her and her reputation. Simon the Pharisee knew her. She didn't need anybody to tell her who she was. She knew who she had been. And that's why she approaches Jesus from behind. She doesn't even feel worthy to come into her presence. She humbles and abases herself at his feet. She didn't kiss his cheek as was the customary greeting of that day. She kissed his feet. She humbles herself to the lowest position. And she's overcome with emotion, broken before his presence as tears pour forth from her heart. And the multitude of her tears attest to the fact that she knew how great was the sin from which Jesus had saved her. In Jesus, she had found grace instead of judgment, forgiveness instead of condemnation, and love instead of rejection. And she could not restrain herself. And she does for Jesus everything Simon the Pharisee failed to do, and she does it with extravagance. Now Simon, Simon was religious. You would find him in the temple every time worship was in session. He was religious, but he was indifferent to Jesus. He felt he was righteous by his own action. So he didn't think he had any need of Jesus. But Simon needed Jesus as much as this woman did. He was a sinner as much as she was. Even though he was a religious leader and lived a quote-unquote moral life. But the Bible says we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We have all sinned. And apart from Jesus, we were all on our way to an eternity of damnation. And we all equally need Jesus. Speak to my heart, Lord. But Simon was righteous in his own eyes. He didn't feel he needed Jesus. So he had little appreciation or love for Jesus. Oh, but this woman, she knew her past. She knew where Jesus found her. She knew what he had saved her from. And she was overwhelmed by his goodness towards her. And she poured out her heart to him in unashamed gratitude, not caring what anyone else might think of her. I want to ask you, church, do you remember what you once were? Do you remember where Jesus brought you from? Do you remember the depths of sin and darkness from which he saved you? Do you realize the hell from which Jesus rescued you? When was the last time you poured your heart out at his feet in the unashamed worship of gratitude for his grace, for his goodness, for his forgiveness towards you, for his salvation? We also see that it pleases him when we pour our heart out in love for how he has loved us. Jesus said, when we are forgiven of much, we also love much. And Jesus saw her extravagant worship as an outpouring of her heart in love towards him. In contrast to Simon's apparent lack of love, as expressed in the absence of even small expressions of love and honor, such as a welcome kiss, the washing of his feet, or the anointing of his head with oil. I think everyone here or listening to me by live stream would claim to love Jesus. But I want to ask you this question. 
Do you love him a little or a lot? Do you love him a little or a lot? Which of the two people in this story reflects your relationship with the Lord? Are you like Simon? Feeling that you pretty much have it together spiritually and don't really need Jesus and his offer of salvation, but it would be kind of nice to have him around in case of an emergency? Or are you like this woman? You know that you were hopelessly lost and you are forever grateful that Jesus reached down and rescued you. Hallelujah. Are you like this woman in that you realize how much Jesus has done for you? You realize that there is nothing better in this life than his love and you pour your heart out in love to him in spite of what others might think of you. Hallelujah. Jesus want us, wants us to look at ourselves and identify whether we are the Pharisee, the religious person that worships him with our mind and would like to have him in close proximity, or are we like this prostitute? Yeah. who says, Jesus, I was lost. I was in the depths of sin. I was bound in darkness. I was on my way to hell. But you reached down and you lifted me up and you saved me, Jesus. Hallelujah. Are you like the Pharisee? Or are you like the prostitute? Obviously, Jesus makes his preference plain. Jesus prefers the worship of the prostitute. What? Being a prostitute. Jesus prefers the worship of this woman who was saved out of a sexually immoral life. So Jesus asks you today, do you love him like Simon the Pharisee? Or do you love him like this woman who was saved from the depths of sin, who can't contain herself because of what Jesus has done for her? And so she just pours her heart out extravagantly and unashamedly to him. Hallelujah. Not only do we pour our heart out in worship, but we need to pour our heart out in faith. Pour our heart out in faith. The wise men poured their heart out in the faith that this was indeed the Messiah, that this tiny baby was the savior of the world who had been prophesied. And in Psalm 62, 8, David writes, Oh, my people, trust in him at all times. Pour out your heart to him, for God is our refuge. You know, David wrote this psalm during a dark time when his own son Absalom had led a rebellion against him to seize the throne and was trying to have his own father killed in order to declare himself as king. And David had to flee from Jerusalem and free, flee from the palace into the wilderness for his life. Yet David finds rest for his soul and hope for the future by pouring his heart out in faith to God. You know, when we are overwhelmed, it pleases God when we pour our heart out to him in faith. When we are overwhelmed with his goodness, it pleases God when we pour our heart out in love and gratitude. But when we are overwhelmed by life's trials, it pleases God when we pour our heart out in faith. I want to say that again. When we are overwhelmed with God's goodness, it pleases God when we pour our heart out in love and worship like the immoral woman at his feet. But when we are overwhelmed with life's trials, it pleases God when we pour our heart out in faith to him like David fleeing for his life. You see, we pour our heart out in faith by praising God for his faithfulness to us in the past. If you look again at David's words in Psalm 62, 6, he says, truly he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will not be shaken. And what David is saying, Lord, you know, as you read the Psalm, you see David is saying, Lord, you have gotten me through a lot of stuff in the past. You have been faithful to me. And David always encouraged his faith by remembering what God had done for him in the past. 
Folks, when you're down and you can't trust God for the present, just look back at your past and remember all that he has brought you through. Hallelujah to the name of the Lord. Yes, God. David remembered when God had delivered a lion and a bear into his bare hands. He remembered when he went out against the giant Goliath with a slingshot and a stone and God delivered the giant into his hand. He remembered the many times God delivered him from the murderous King Saul who was hunting him down to kill him. David remembered how God had rescued him time and time again in his past. God had been a safe refuge. God had been his place of protection from every attack of the enemy and from the storms of life. And David pours his heart out in the remembrance of faith in this psalm and in many others. For instance, in Psalm 18, verses 1 through 3, David writes, when God had delivered him from Saul, I love you, Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my strong hold. I called unto the Lord who is worthy of praise and so I have been saved from my enemies. David is praising God because here he is being hunted by Saul and he said I cried out to God and he saved me. Hallelujah. Now if you were to write a song of praise to God I write songs to him all the time. They're generally out of key because I can't sing very good but God likes a joyful noise. Amen. But he says, I, I, I want to ask you, if you were to write your own song of praise, you know, David talked about the lion and the bear and Goliath and delivering him from King Saul. But if you were to write your own song of praise, pouring your heart out for what God has done for you, what would you include in your song that you are praising God for? I know I would include how he saved me. I know I would include how there were times in Bible college where I had no money and God came through for me in miraculous ways. I would include the time we expanded from our small location down there to this location. Our rent tripled and God, when I was fearful of signing that contract, God said, just preach the gospel. Don't worry about the finances. I'll take care of the finances. Hallelujah. And he did exactly what he said he would do. Within a matter of three months, not only had our, our attendance tripled, but our giving had tripled. Hallelujah. And God fulfilled his word. Hallelujah. If I were writing my song, I would include how impossible it seemed that we would ever be able to get land. Because as we were looking for land, land was over a million dollars an acre. And the price of land was going up like this. And our building fund was going up like this. But God in 2008, hallelujah, and actually preceding that because the three years preceding the recession, we had record levels of giving and we were able to save $3 million and then boom, came the recession. Prices went down. We were able to get 13 and a half acres of land for $5 million and banks were not lending, but God had enabled us to save $3 million. There was an assumable $2.5 million loan. So God, even to the amount did a miracle for us. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I would include in my song how God healed me from stage three cancer. There's so many other things to praise him for in my past. And as Jeremiah said in Lamentations 321, when we remember what God has done for us in the past, it gives us hope for the future. Hallelujah to the name of the Lord. So, say what has God brought you through what would be on your list of remembrances of what God has done for you how has he answered your prayer how has he spoken to you through a verse through a message through a song when you were at your lowest point but he came through and he answered you how has he provided for you hallelujah whatever he's done for you can you pour your heart out in prayer Hallelujah. We pour our heart out in faith. 
when we are overwhelmed by our present circumstances, but we praise him for what he has done for us in the past. And we pour our heart out in faith by trusting his power and his promise for the future. Hallelujah. It's easy to trust when things are going well. But what about when the bottom falls out? Like what was happening in David's life. David says, I will trust in the Lord at all times. Hallelujah. And verses 11 and 12 of that psalm, he says, power belongs to you, God. And with you, Lord, is unfailing love. You know, God is the all-powerful one. All powerful. You may not have any power over your enemies. You may not have any power over the sickness in your body. You may not have any power over your circumstance. You may not have any power over what happens tomorrow. But God, the all-powerful one, he holds your tomorrow in his hands. Hallelujah. And David is saying, God... I'm trusting my future. I don't know what's going to happen. My son and his men are hunting me down. I've had to leave Jerusalem. I've had to leave the palace. I I, I don't know what tomorrow holds, Lord, but I trust you with my life. Hallelujah. I'm trusting my future into your hands. I'm trusting that you love me. I'm trusting that your love will not fail me. I'm trusting that your power is able to fulfill your promise to me that I would sit upon on the throne of Israel. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. God promised David the throne and Absalom could not take it from him. And David is pouring his heart out in faith saying, God, I trust your love. I trust your power. I trust your promise. I trust you with my life. I trust you with my future. I trust you with these threats against me. I trust you to keep your promise. And you know, it pleases God when we reject self-pity and we start praising him. David could have had a pity party, couldn't he? God, I've been through so much. For seven to ten years, I had to flee from Saul. God, my other son, he tried to kill me before. And now this one, God, how many more times? He could have had a pity party, couldn't he? And, And he would have been justified in doing so. He'd been through a lot of stuff. But he rejected having a pity party and instead he started to praise God in faith. Hallelujah. We need to make a choice when we're going through it to stop and reject having a pity party and turn to God and pour our heart out to him in faith. When you're facing an uncertain future, when you've lost a loved one, when you've lost your job, when your spouse has walked out on you, when you're facing a medical problem, when you're facing financial difficulty, when you're afraid, when you're confused. Yes, we want to get down. Yes, we feel discouraged, but we need to make a choice to pour our heart out to God and say, God, you've always been there for me in the past, and I trust your power. I trust your love will get me through. So I have hope. I have hope for the future. The wise men opened their treasures and presented it to Jesus. They had traveled for two years carrying those treasures from Persia to Judea. Those treasures had been locked up tight in a treasure chest. They had been hidden in the packs on the camel's backs. But it was not until it was opened and poured out, offered to Jesus, that it became worship that was well-pleasing in his sight. The worship that pleases the Lord is when we open ourselves up and pour our hearts out to him. When we make ourselves vulnerable. When we hold nothing back in unashamed worship, when we pour our hearts out in faith to him, especially in the difficult times of life, but we choose to praise him for what he has done for us in our past. We choose to praise him for his faithfulness. We choose to praise him because we trust him with our future. How's your heart? How's your love for Jesus? Are you like Simon the Pharisee? Or were you like, are you like this former prostitute? How's your heart? God is calling us to open up and pour our hearts out to him 
in worship and gratitude and love and in faith. Are you like David, pouring your heart out in trust to God, despite what you are facing right now? Because I know some of you are facing stuff right now. How's your heart? God is calling us to pour our hearts out in faith to him. And the first step to offering to God the worship that is pleasing to him is to come to Jesus like the wise men came to Jesus. Repent of our sins and place our faith in him. You know, the Bible says that we have all sinned and sin separates us from God. It, It cuts us off from God. But no matter who you are or what you have done, God loves you and he has made a way for you to be forgiven of your sins and to be saved from the judgment to come. And that way is named Jesus, who came from heaven to earth, lived a sinless life, and offered that life on the cross, taking the penalty for sin that we deserve. And that is the love and the goodness of God towards us. So that now when we repent of our sins, and the word repent simply means to turn away from, It means we recognize we've been heading in the wrong direction. We've been living life our way without regard for God. We've been living a life of sin. And we make a U-turn and say, God, I don't want to live that way anymore. Forgive me. And we turn to God in faith. That's repentance and that's placing our faith in God. And the moment we do that, God forgives us. Jesus says we're born again. We're made spiritually alive. And we become children of God. And we can have the confidence of God's blessing in this life and the promise of heaven for eternity. And if you're here this morning or you're listening to us by live stream and you have never given your heart to Jesus or maybe you did some years ago and you drifted away but you want to come back, I want to invite you to pray this prayer with me today. And just it's just a simple prayer of repenting of our sins and placing our faith in Jesus. And the moment that you do that, God is going to forgive you. He's going to give you spiritual life. And you're going to become a child of God and begin a wonderful lifelong journey of learning to love and serve him. So would you pray this prayer with me? Dear Jesus, I believe that you are the son of God. And I believe that you love me so much that you died for my sins. Today, I confess that I'm a sinner. I repent. I turn away from my sin. And I turn to you in faith. Forgive me and come and live inside of me and help me from this day forward to live for you in Jesus name amen amen if you prayed that prayer for the first time or the first time in a long time if you're here in person if you would just type the words I prayed to the number on the screen we just want to send you a free e-booklet if you're listening to us online then just in the comments type the words I pray we just want to congratulate you welcome you to the family of God you just made the absolute best decision of your life and we congratulate you amen Amen. But more importantly, we want to send you a free e-booklet. And it's a simple little booklet that's going to help you understand what you just did and also how you can move forward in your faith journey and continue to grow in your relationship with the Lord. We want to send this to you free of charge. All you need to do is to type in the comments, I prayed. And a little bit later today, we're going to send you a message with a link in it. Click that link, fill in your name and your email address, and we will send you free of charge this little booklet. We're not going to bombard you with a bunch of uh, emails. We just want to send you this free e-booklet. But very quickly, for those who just prayed that prayer, I want to encourage you to get started doing three things right away that will help you to grow in your faith. One, talk to God every day. You don't need any special language. Talk to him as you would a friend. But start first with thanking him. The Bible says we enter into his gates with thanksgiving. That's the way into his presence. And so just thank him every day for the good things in your life, for life itself, for strength, for health, for food, for shelter, for your loved ones, for whatever good is going on in your life because everything good comes from him. And then talk to him about whatever you're facing that day, whatever problems, issues, struggles uh, that you're facing, just talk to him about that and ask his help. And that's how we begin our prayer life. Secondly, let God talk to you every day. And how does God talk to us? The number one way he talks to us is through his word, the Bible. If you don't have a Bible, then just download the YouVersion app on your phone or your tablet. It's free of charge and you can read the Bible there. Start in the book
book of First John. It's just five short chapters, one of the shortest books in the Bible. But it tells us who Jesus is and what he's done for us. Just read a few verses every day. And before you start reading, just ask God to help you understand what he's saying and what he's speaking to you. And then thirdly, we encourage you to get connected to a local church where you can continue to be taught and grow in your relationship with the Lord. If you're here in South Florida, of course, we invite you to come and connect with us at New Life Assembly. We have a wonderful church family that will walk alongside of you, pray for you, encourage you, and help you to grow in your relationship with the Lord. If you're outside of the South Florida area, then we encourage you to find a local Assembly of God church in your area. Get connected and start attending on a regular basis. As we close our service, for those of us who've already placed our faith in Christ, this Christmas, God wants worship that is not just from our minds, but from the depths of our inner being. He wants us to pour our hearts out to him. Let's make a recommitment to worship the Lord by opening up our hearts and worshiping him in gratitude for who he is, for what he has done for us, for where he has brought us from. I am forever grateful to God for saving me. Let's worship him with with a heart of gratitude for, for saving us, for what he's done for us, for his love for us. And let's worship him with a heart of faith that says, God, as I look back, I see your hand in so many ways in my life. You've brought me through so much, Lord God. So I have faith that you're gonna bring me through in the future, in whatever I'm facing, Lord. God. Let's make a recommitment to worship the Lord with with all of our heart. Just open ourselves up and worship him in the raw honesty and authenticity and vulnerability of true, unreserved heart worship. Would you stand to your feet as we just pray this prayer? Dear Jesus, we just love you, Lord God. You lift up your voice and you pray from your heart making this commitment. Dear Jesus, we just love you, Lord, and we thank you so much for all that you have done for us, Lord God. We thank you for sending your son, Jesus. We thank you for his saving work on the cross. We thank you that you changed not only the course of history, but you changed the course of our life and our future destiny through Jesus Christ. We thank you for saving us, for redeeming us, for rescuing us from the pit that you found us in, Lord God. We thank you for all that you have done for us. And we make a recommitment of our hearts today, Lord God, to open our hearts up in honesty, and in vulnerability before you and just to love you with all that is within us, with all of our heart, with all of our mind, with all of our strength and to worship you with a trust that says, God, you've brought me this far and I know that you will not abandon me. I'm trusting you with my future, Lord God. Lord, we recommit ourselves to worship you, not from our mind, but from the depths of our inner being. We love you, we honor you and we pray your blessing upon your people today as we go from this place, Lord God. Let your word and your spirit continue to minister to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Church, you may be seated for just a moment. Thank you for all of those that tuned in by live stream. Don't forget to join us back tonight at 630 for our Sunday evening uh, live stream. And we pray that you will have a blessed and restful Sunday and a wonderful holiday season as we keep our mind focused on Jesus. God bless you and thank you so much. Amen. Amen.